And after we're on solidly, you can just start the video. The American Heart Association estimates that a stroke death occurs just about every three and a half minutes. The average number of daily stroke-related deaths, 405. Stroke is also a leading cause of long-term disability in the United States. But a stroke isn't a death sentence. In fact, recognizing the signs of stroke and acting fast could help save a life. When a blood vessel in the brain becomes blocked or bursts, a stroke occurs. The two main types of stroke are ischemic, which involves a blockage in the vessel that transports blood to the brain, and hemorrhagic, or a stroke that involves bleeding in the brain. If you don't know the signs of stroke, you're not alone. 30% of people under the age of 45 don't know either. But there's a quick and easy way to remember. It's an acronym known as Be Fast. B stands for balance. Watch out for balance problems, like trouble with standing or walking. E is for eyes. Look for vision changes. This could be blurred vision or vision loss in one or both eyes. F is for face. Watch for droopiness on either side of the face or ask if the person's face feels numb. You can always ask them to smile if you're unable to tell. A stands for arm. Check for weakness or numbness in the arms or legs. You can ask the person to raise their arms to see if there are any issues. S is for speech. Listen for speech problems. This might include trouble getting the words out or slurred speech. Ask the person to repeat an easy sentence to verify this. T, time. Don't hesitate. Call 911 immediately. Always call 911 to ensure that the person is diagnosed and treated quickly. Why? While stroke treatments can be given up to 24 hours after a person starts to experience one, they're more effective when given earlier on. So, when you call 911, always let emergency services know the last time the patient appeared not to have any symptoms and never drive someone to the hospital if they're having a stroke. Emergency services can get them there faster and relay important information to hospital staff. So now you know the signs of a stroke. Just be fast and you can help someone get the care they need immediately. and just so impossible to like really just say what I like am um, feeling, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> what do you want? No, you go. You go. Want me to do yeah. it? Right. <laughs> you right. go. Okay, it was uh, a regular night. Um, Sam had had some symptoms like the migraine and stuff beforehand, but nothing alarming. I dropped the glass of wine and I said something and I was dizzy and confused and I just started laughing. When I turned around and looked at Sam, I could clearly see like her face, right side of her face was drooping. 
So I called my sister, who's a PA, and she was just like calling an ambulance right now. Oh. I first met Sam when I was the on-call stroke neurologist the night that she experienced the symptoms of stroke. Even though she was quite young and didn't have typical stroke risk factors, they made the brave call to call 911 and have Sam transported to the local hospital where the emergency physicians reached out to us immediately so that we could administer that time-sensitive medication called TPA. Um, from there, we recognized that she had the type of stroke that could benefit from a large vessel surgery. So she was flown with a helicopter to come to Johns Hopkins for that time-sensitive treatment and underwent it beautifully. After my surgery, my recovery began immediately. I wasn't able to speak, <laughs> so the nurses and the therapists, like the speech, occupational and physical therapists just were all on top of the, their um, everything. <laughs> I start to learn yes or no, um, and then I learn, you know, I love you. So I like repeated like for Nick and my family, like, I love you. There were times in those early moments where I just thought she could be there for weeks you know, or who knows when Sam will be home. However, as the days went on, um, you know, it kind of the time frame shortened, you know, it was like, oh, we got her out of the ICU much faster than we thought, you know, oh, her recovery is going a lot faster than we thought, you know, and so thankfully, like, she was able to get out on Friday, which was actually our anniversary of our marriage. So that was kind of like a nice uh, thing that happened. For our anniversary, I we do our vows, and I couldn't say them. So, like Nick had to say my vows, but I just felt like that moment, like I just you're my rock. <laughs> so yeah. But this year, you did your vows. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hey, Sam, it's so great to see you. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> you look absolutely terrific. Well, thanks. <laughs> we are so happy about how well you're doing, Sam, and I know it's like unbelievable to even process th that this has happened, but you have come through it like a star, I would say. Thanks. <laughs> I um, I practice like a lot, <laughs> so. I am, um, but I, I still have aphasia and I still have apraxia, so, you know, it's, but I just, I can't thank you enough and, you know, I, um, like, my family, my friends, like, you just stood by me, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for saying that, Sam. It's a joy to see you. I think you did everything right in terms of helping your brain heal mm -hmm. um, after we got a little jump start of your treatment after this stroke. So you should be proud of yourself. Great, thank you for that. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. We are at the end of the Stroke Awareness Month and dedicating this last talk for the month to stroke awareness. Um, something that of course is close to me. Uh, I had a stroke almost two years ago, it was August of 2020. So um, since then have become a, an advocate for stroke awareness and for promoting ideals to support prevention and different aspects of that. Today, I have the opportunity and the pleasure of having the panel itself discuss the different areas of prevention within their different fields. So typically we have a guest speaker today. Our guest speakers are our panel. So looking forward to having the panel here to discuss these different aspects of it. I wanted to show these videos first so that you could see um, well, so you could see what it was that a stroke was so that there was no confusion as to what a stroke actually is. And then to see a story of someone that I think that most people don't typically think of 
when you think of someone who's had a stroke, she's in her late twenties when she had it. Um, and it came on suddenly, I think most of the time, at, and at least for me, before my own experience, you think that it is something that occurs with people that are much older and has something to do with particularly unhealthy lifestyle, maybe a lot of smoking, a lot of drinking, um, or a lot of bad food. So all of these different things, which we'll talk about because those do contribute to your chances of having a stroke, but you can have a stroke outside of those parameters and have nothing like that happen. So we'll share that information as well. So blood vessels in the brain become blocked or burst. So those were the two different types of strokes that they had mentioned. There's another that is uh, similar to an ischemic, and it's called a transient, a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, which is a temporary sort of it's like a mini stroke. When you hear about people talking about a mini stroke, it's a stroke that happens and it's not very long. And when I say very long, it's a couple of minutes, but it can still do quite a bit of damage. You can lose, I had seen an, a statistic, lose 1.9 neurons a minute with the lack of oxygen to your brain. And as you know, neurons are what transmits messages throughout your body. So I could really relate to the video that we saw because I have to do that a lot. Uh, I know that there's something that says that if you like look up or like if you're looking in a certain like you're lying or something like that, I'm looking up all the time to retrieve messages because it is more difficult for me to remember or to recall things when I'm speaking sometimes. And so that's something that I do. So then when I was watching her, I, I, uh, that really resonated with me because you could tell that she was like almost thinking extra hard just to talk. And sometimes it's like that for me. Sometimes it's like that with the brain fog. So we'll discuss that too, because I think it's important to understand those aspects of it so that you can be more empathetic if something like this were to occur in your family and understand that it just, sometimes it just takes time and everyone's situation is very different. So you cannot base how it is that someone is within your family on something else that you saw. Some people don't quote unquote fully recover ever. And some people will go six months and they're almost exactly as they were prior to the stroke. So it really just depends and it has absolutely nothing to do with physicalness, willpower, nothing. It is a mix of different people's circumstances at that time, their body, their situation, what they have available to them. The people who recover the best are the people who have the best support systems, who have you know access to doctors. That time aspect of it is super important. When they talk about that, when I say that you lose 1.9% neurons a minute, that means every minute counts. Every minute counts. If you wait, if you aren't able to get to the doctor right away, if they're not able to see you right away, if they're not able to administer any sort of medication to you right away, each of those minutes count. And each of those minutes where you're losing neurons, when you come out of it, you have to go back and relearn all of those different things that those neurons are no longer able to communicate with too. So all of that is very, very important. Um, so we'll go into it. I'm, I wanted to know um, how surprised you were with some of these statistics. A death every thir three and a half minutes. And that's a leading cause of long-term disability. This is what they were saying within the video that we saw earlier. 10 to 15% of the strokes are related to people between the ages of 18 and 50. 18 and 50. So a lot of these people are not even over the age of 50. When you think about about 15 million people are affected worldwide by strokes. So that means about 1.5 million people are affected below the age of 50. So these we're not just talking about people who are are, are elderly, like 70s or 80s. We're not just talking about those people. We're talking about people who are in their 20s, in their 30s. I'm on a few support groups for stroke victims, uh, sorry, for stroke survivors. And all of these pe people that I have personally met are not over the age of 40. So I've talked to different people who have had different strokes. One 
was 37 when she had hers. Another was uh, 28 when he had his, a 30 year old had his, and these are different circumstances. Sometimes it's genetic. You hear a lot about people having aneurysms. You hear a lot about people, or sometimes about people who find out later that they have a, a hole in their heart. And then with the way that the blood went through, depending on which side it went through, um, it can cause a blood clot. So, and these are just things that you may not know. These are things that some people live with and never have anything happen. So we're gonna talk about the preventative methods that we in each of these areas can provide both during, I mean, both before a stroke, preventative and post-stroke. If you've had a stroke, what it is that you can do to help with your recovery process. We'll talk about that now. And understand though, that we're talking about 80% of the people of this, 80% of the prevention that we're talking about, it, it helps like with 80% of the people who have strokes. So we're understanding, remember that the other 20% is sort of that anomaly that we're like, okay, well then there are people who are super healthy. There are people who do all of these things and they still have a stroke. So just keep that in mind. What we're here to provide for you is information to help you and to keep you in that, I guess, the best light possible. But then that doesn't mean that you could not ever have a stroke because of that. Okay, so we'll start with Sherry. Sherry is going to share with us the movement aspect of prevention for strokes. Thank you, Phoenix. So definitely what you're saying in regards to that number of 18, between 18 and 50 has it. Uh, what a lot of people think, like you were saying earlier, that they expect it in, the, in folks who are 70s, in the 60s and 80s because they're older and that's expected. Now with these numbers of between 18 and 50, it's just like, wait, what? And I feel that age group, especially the younger age group, feeling like, well, I'm young, I'm healthy, something like that can't happen to me because I don't fit that demographic of being um, a senior citizen, right? But we're learning that that's changing. Life is changing. Things are changing. Demographics are changing. And we have to have those preventative measures, right? Eating healthy, you know, having physical activity, movement. It doesn't have to wait until you're older to start it. And that's the thought process of a lot of people is, as I get older, I am going to be more fit, right? Because the younger I am, I, I have that system, I have that body that I'll be able to get well quick uh, because I'm younger. And we can't use that anymore because things are shifting, you know, strokes are happening younger and younger. And you can see from that video. So making sure um, having a healthy diet. I'm not talking about super, super healthy. A lot of people feel like I need to have this strict diet, but you need to be aware of what's going in your body. Um, and also making those annual appointments. A lot of people skip over having those annual appointments. I do mine on the clockwork. Like I do the same month, same month every year. I know when I have my appointments because it's just, I do everything the same day, everything. Right. And that's where it comes in that you can find out if you have a heart murmur, if you have some some type of disorder, you you can sit down with your doctor and go over your results. I'm one that sit down with my doctor and be like, all right, explain this to me, explain that to me. Like, what does this mean? And and, and you took blood work for this. What does that mean? You need to understand exactly what your results are. Some people just to get their results. Yeah, everything is okay, but explain to me exactly why all of this happened in the blood work, right? What does this mean? Is this good? Is this bad? It's sitting down with your doctors and really having that conversation for the results. Like Phoenix said, some of this is, is can be heredity and you don't know it. A lot of people don't know their the background, their, their family history, medical history, um, especially in some of the African American community, because some of us don't talk about it. All right, we don't talk about certain things. They want they want to keep things a secret. <laughs> I don't know why. You know, sometimes you want to keep it a secret of like, and then you find out it's like, wait, he he died of what? 
yeah, it's a family thing. What? I didn't know that. Okay, this is it, it's super important in, in asking your parents, asking cousins, family members. Every time the doctor asks, you know, what's in your family? Is this something in your family? And it's like, no, I know for sure because I ask my mom all the time, did so-and-so have this? And my mom is always one to talk about everybody. And she knows everyone's business, which is great for me because then I know who has who has had certain medical issues that, that that could affect me, that could affect my sisters and their kids, right? It, it goes down the line. So that's another preventive measure to take is knowing family background, knowing medical history, knowing your medical history so you can pass it down to your kids, your grandkids. It has to happen um, now if it hasn't been happening. Um, and it has to, the talk has to happen more times than often, right? Um, I know my mom has had too many strokes um, she was in her um, her 50s when it happened, <laughs> but she was on the phone and she was just like, yeah, I mean, my, my arm is just like, it's just like it feels heavy and, and my leg, I think I'm just going to have some tea. I'm like, no, no, you're not going to have tea. You're going to, you're going to go to the hospital. She's like, no, I don't want to go to the hospital. I'm like, I think you need to go to the hospital. She's like, okay. I'm like, call me when you get to the hospital. She, I'm in New Jersey, she's in New York, and I'm just like, call me. And it's literally like going on an hour. I'm like, what has happened? She calls from the hospital. She's like, yeah, they say I had a, a mini stroke. I'm like, what took you so long? It took a whole hour. She's like, no, I took the bus to the hospital. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you have some folks who really, especially the older generation who just don't, it's just like, for, for her, it was just like, no, I'm just gonna take a bus. Why am I gonna, why am I gonna take a cab? Like, why am I gonna call 911? It just, it's just, I just don't feel well, you know? And they had to like really tell her, ma'am, like, this is serious. You really, you had a mini stroke. This could have been a full blown stroke. And now I'm staying on top of her to do that. And that's another preventive measure of, those who have had these little minis or um, have some side effects or some symptoms to like be on top of them and be like, you need to really look into that or you should go to the doctor. You need to check this because if not, uh, it, it can be something that's full blown. And I'm always on top of her about like, she's like, oh, I feel like this. I'm like, go, go, go to the doctor. No, I don't feel like I'm going to call your doctor right now and then force you to do it. Um, and she thinks I'm nagging, right? Be a nagger. Be that person to be on top of someone you know that can benefit from it. Um, that can, You can be that savior. You can be that person that actually get in a good time. Like Phineas was saying, it's a time thing, right? Every minute count. Every second count. So... Don't feel like you're nagging, you're, you're saving that person's life, right? So making sure like you're on top of things and, and seeing the results of being on top of it in those preventive measures, yeah, if it happens, at least you're doing, you, you did your best so that it's not as bad as it could have been, right? And if it gets to the point where you do have a stroke, you know that getting out of it and the aftermath of it is still a long road like the video she, she she's still always making sure that she's on top of making sure she's moving and walking and and doing activity like she was baking movement is such a key factor in getting better it's not going to be instant it's not going to be instant it's not going to be instant right it's gonna take time for the brain to process things, for the body to move, for the fingers to move, for the toes to move, for the body to be where it used to, but it has to take time. And other than physical therapy, it's basically still adding more activities to your life and your routine so that your body and your brain can start that connection again and movement. Um, my mom knits, she never used to knit, now she knits because it keeps her 
hands and fingers moving, right? And I, I feel that she can focus more when she's she's doing something and, and then she can talk. Sometimes I'm just like, I don't understand what you're saying, but she's talking and she's moving, right? That movement is helping her um, get better and get her brain to like keep moving and have fingers to move. And that's what uh, folks need to do. It's, it's the small things, it's the small things, whether it's walking, whether it's like snapping your fingers, clapping your hand, like the small movements are going to make the biggest difference because you're moving. And it doesn't have to be a, a mile walk, right? Set yourself up for success and just say, today I'm going to do this. You know, each day add a little thing to the, the routine of movement. Don't think of it as exercise, think of it as movement. I think when folks feel like, oh, exercise is just like, it's a lot. Movement. Let's. I'm just gonna go outside and move. I'm just. I'm just gonna walk right down there to the block. I'm gonna walk to the park. All right. Um, I'm. I'm gonna dance a little bit at home. Put the music on. Um, a little Janet Jackson on. Movement is gonna be make it fun. Make it something that you enjoy to keep that movement. To keep that body movement. And over time, the connection will come back. Right but it's a constant thing. Like everything in life, you have to make sure that you keep a routine. You, you stay disciplined. And that's in everything we do and, and how we eat and how we move and how we have relationships. Everything needs to be cultivated. Everything needs growth and you have to nurture each movement and each things you do. So it's important to add, add movement but you can keep adding that level layers and layers of activity and it's some strength strength training holding a dumbbell holding um an equipment that's that's really good for your grip right and movement and and shifting that's gonna help so don't feel like you're not getting it right now you're not getting it today each day it's going to add on to your progress and chalk it down write it down that's another way you're moving right you can write it down with those write it down document your journey your journey your journey um from start to finish and then you can look back on it and be like wow i did that right just know that it's a daily thing it's 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 never going to stop it's it's for life right it's for life so um but think movement and making sure that you keep those preventative measures and even after um having a stroke um, and having that support system to kind of help you along the way and i think that you brought up a few great points sherry i mean first off of course you're talking about movement so associating it with movement and not exercise because especially as a stroke survivor sometimes they're limited to a wheelchair or they have to use a cane. So the whole idea of someone telling them, well, you need to exercise sounds ludicrous. It's like, I can't even walk. Like now you're trying to tell me that I need to go right. work out, you know, but it's not just that it is moving. I was watching a video where someone was doing physical therapy and their physical therapy was pulling Kleenex out of a box and they counted how many they could successfully pull out of a box within a certain amount of time. That was their physical therapy. I mean, and there were days where they couldn't even open their fist because their fingers, they couldn't move their fingers. I really was, I really like that you brought up that your mom started knitting. That's such a, and I mean, on the flip side of that, I, I can only imagine with some of the people that I've spoken to, how they are thinking, you know, I can't even like pull my fingers apart, let alone knit. So then to be able to do those little movements and control those movements is really key in the recovery because a lot of it is a sporadic sort of movement that you can't control. Like you get to right. where you can't control picking up your leg or you can't control how quickly different things move. That was the hardest thing for me to adjust to initially. And that's what I was trying to tell people. It's like, I don't feel like I'm not strong. I feel like I can't control what it is that I'm doing. So I'm like walking around on, a rubber band leg. That's what I kept saying. I was like, I can't control, I can't pick it up. I can't put it down. Like I can't 
control the movement. And so those little things um, really help with the recovery. So that was a really good thing that you said. Another thing that you said that was good was about the routine and having a routine and having something that is consistent because that is what is going to get you down that road to a, a closer uh, vision of what it is that you, where you were. And that, right. that, that isn't linear. There are days where you wake up and you can't do what you did yesterday. And that's okay. That doesn't mean you're not progressing. That just means that's where your body is that day. And that is another really hard thing to get your, your head around. Because yeah, I think and not getting frustrated and not getting frustrated frustrated in the process. Absolutely. Because and especially with all of us, we've been athletes, we've all worked out, you know, and we've been taught as people who train other people. Okay, well then it's about progression. You work from here. Once you've gotten to where you can do that, then you move up to this. And then once you do that and et cetera. So then you expect to get stronger. You expect to get faster because of these different things that you've done and those steps that you've made to get to that point and surviving a stroke and going through and helping yourself through a stroke is not like that. It's not always like that. There are days where you don't feel like you can even get up. There are days where you have a brain fog. There are days where you can't remember what it was that you did. There are days where you can't brush your teeth from the day before. So there are a lot of different things that you have to remember and remind yourself and have that grace of, okay, today's not that day, you know? Right. Maybe I try right. later. Or maybe I started over tomorrow, but it doesn't mean that you're not able to get better. You know, it's a right. training process. It's a training process. It's like going on vacation. You've worked out for weeks. You go on vacation. You stay home for a week. You come back. Are you living the same? No. <laughs> Probably not. Expecting, having that expectation. Um, and I won't touch on this just yet, but another thing that you really uh, that you brought up that was great, and I'll touch on this a little bit later because um, I'm a huge advocate for this is being your own advocate, is being your own cheerleader, is making sure that when you go to the doctor, that you don't just assume that what it is that they're telling you is the Bible. They may not know exactly what it is that's going on with you. They have knowledge. They have a lot of patience. So then a lot of times they could be dealing with different things and not know exactly what it is that is good for you. Know how your body feels, understand what that feels like, what that looks like, I, when I went to urgent care after I had my stroke, the doctor, um, before I went to the ER, she was like, here, take this. And I looked at it and I was like, what is that? And she said, it's aspirin so that you can help with thinning your blood. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm allergic to aspirin. She didn't even ask me. It's really important to understand what it is that they're giving you and not just take things, not just take things, understand what it is that they're giving you. Just like Sherry had mentioned, it's like, okay, well then why are you doing that? What is that for? Know what those different things are because you're going to have to account for that later, not them. They don't know exactly, like I said, and a lot of times, especially when you go to like ER or urgent care, you're going in with what it is that you're going in with that day. They don't know what happened to you when you were a kid. They don't know all the different ailments that you grew up with. They have no idea. They're trying to treat you for what it is that they're giving to you at that time and band-aid a lot of times what it is that's going on until they can figure out the grand scheme of things, but there's no telling what they could mess up in the meantime, if they give you something that you're not supposed to have. Thank right. you for that. Um, we'll go now to uh, Gail, who will give us the nutritional aspects. Um, so yeah, I had a quick question for you, uh, Phoenix. Um, the, the, the video that showed um, the young lady, um, her process of recovering from a stroke, and I noticed that it had um, physical therapy, it had speech therapy. Was nutrition any part of that program where they talked about nutrition after um, uh, after a stroke or even before a stroke? Was was that part of um, since you had, could, you've been through this? So was that an aspect of part of your recovery? I mean, I know for you, you've been doing this forever, so you know nutrition. But um, did any of your doctors um, recommend anything to you as far as from a nutrition standpoint? No, and I think that that's a really good question and a really good point. Because, and I, I honestly think that that is a good point across the board. I think a lot of times when you go to the doctor, they're not asking you, well, what are you eating? Like if you have some sort, if you have high blood pressure, if you have cholesterol, these are different things that you can remedy through your diet Correct. before they're trying to give you some sort of blood pressure medicine, before they're trying to give you some sort of cholesterol medicine, before they're trying to give you insulin for diabetes. Well, what are you doing? Let's make these changes first. 
and see how they change your numbers. Typically, that's not what happens. Um, and this is a conversation that I've had on a lot of the support groups because that association is not made in the doctor's office and in the hospitals. People don't come out of strokes making that association either. So the first thing that they, and one of the stroke survivors that I had I'd spoken with I had brought up a good point because what she was saying was, and this is with everybody, you can't move half of your body or you can't talk. They're, you're debilitated in some way. That's the first thing that you're thinking about. How do I move again? How do I move again? So you're thinking about the physical, not understanding that at this point, all of those different things, all of the areas that you are all in contribute to that physical aspect of it. And people don't, they just think I need to fix my leg. You can't fix your leg if your brain is not right. You can't fix your leg if your mind isn't right. You can't fix your leg if your body is still ingesting a lot of the foods that put you there in the first place. And people don't get that. And they're not educated with that. So that's a really good point because I don't think that it is enunciated or stressed enough, especially coming from the hospitals. Yeah, and I'm not surprised because, and this is not to knock the you know medical industry, but doctors aren't, you know, when they go to medical school, they're not, nutrition is probably a, a sub a sub subject unless it's something that they're gonna go into, um, into a scientific, you know, um, aspect of being a doctor. But generally nutrition is the second, is the, you know, is the last thing on a doctor's mind. Um, kind of like, I think you and Sherry said, well, I think you had said that their job is to get you well, right? And they only know how to get you well through, through medicine, you know, um, through physical therapy, speech therapy, and those things are all great and well, you know? But from a dietary standpoint, um, they have no clue. And which is so ironic because food is integral in everything that we do. You know, we do it around our family. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it's part of our life. It's part of our culture, you know? And for it not to be a subject um, as far as from a health perspective is really interesting, you know, because we spend billions and billions of dollars on food, you know, on, um, on different, every kind of food. You can walk through the grocery store and you see, a thousand breads, you walk, you know, you can go down the aisle, you know, that uh, pasta aisle, there's 25 different pastas, you know, that you probably shouldn't be eating anyway. So um, I'm not surprised to hear that. So, and kind of like what you had said about an advocate, um, you have to be your own advocate, um, especially from a nutrition standpoint, because there's so much out there, there's so much information out there. Um, and generally what I tell my clients that are um, that have hyper that have hypertension or or runs in their family. You know, it's a pretty easy. I feel it's a pretty easy diet, um, and I don't even like to call it a diet. It's just a way of eating. It's called a dash diet, and it's just a dietary approach to stop hypertension. And I think anybody, even if you are um, not subject to this, if, you know, if it's not something that runs in your family, that you should be eating like this anyway. You know, you, you eat your grains, you eat your fruits, you um, eat your fruits and vegetables. Um, when your mother told you to eat your fruits and vegetables, she meant that. Um, lean meats, um, stay away from anything that's saturated fat. You should be doing this anyway. You know, even again, if you're not prone to hypertension. Um, and I think um, when, when you follow something like this, and I think it, it can fit any lifestyle. Um, I even some diabetic uh, clients that I have, I give them the DASH diet. Um, I may tweak it a little bit based on their sweets, you know, based on um, carbohydrate intake. Um, that sort of thing. So I think, yes, you have to be your own advocate, do your homework. Um, if you're not sure um, what to eat, hire a nutritionist. Um, there's so much information out there on what to eat, what not, you know, what to eat, what not to eat. And um, so, yeah, be your own advocate. Um, I can't stress that enough um, because, you know, they will fill you up with pills. They'll fill you up with, you know, um, anything they can fill you up with but truly you need the nutrients from food, especially um, a sh someone that has suffered a stroke because you need the different grains and vegetables and fruits. You need those portion sizes because that's what feeds your brain. That's what feeds your muscles that helps in your recovery. And that's the part that they don't talk about because if you're eating junk, then your brain is, you're gonna have brain fog, right? And you're not, you're not gonna be able to heal properly. So yes. I, I recommend anybody to um, do your homework, be your own advocate. If you know, ask your doctor, you know, what is it that I should be eating? And it doesn't have to be an all in, like kind of like what Sherry said about, you know, about movement. 
just when you start to make those small changes, whether you're um, free hypertension or you have hypertension, it's making those small changes. Maybe it's this week, you know, cutting out um, sugary things, you know, or maybe it's, you know, taking out all the saturated fats, you know, just only eating lean meat. You start with small things and you build upon that. And, you know, and I think you will see a different, a, a change in, um, in your movement, in your thinking, you're not, you know, you're not foggy. Um, so, yeah. And I think that um, you mentioned hypertension and I wanted to also ask about inflammation and then this may be something that both um, you, Gail and Sina could also probably touch on because inflammation contributes to a lot of the chronic illnesses and people most of the time do not make, again, those associations. So from your perspective, what is it that different people can do within their diet that can prevent inflammation? And what are some highly inflammatory foods that people ingest day to day and they don't usually think about when it comes to inflammation? I mean, I, it's pretty, it, I think it's pretty simple. Anything that's in a box is not good for you um, unless it's something like an oatmeal and that's pure, that's plain oatmeal. Anything that's in a box, pasta, those sort of things, they just have so much stuff in it that, um, you know, it contributes to, you know, it, it tears your gut up. So just keep, keep it simple. Do fruits, vegetables, um, grains, brown rice, those sort of things. Stay away from cheeses, um, milk, dairy, that causes a lot of inflammation. Um, you can have dairy, but I would limit it to low fat dairy and uh, maybe a couple of times a week. Um, so basically just eat whole foods, stay away from the stuff that, you know, in a box, if you have it every now and then that's fine. Um, sugar, uh, refined sugar that causes inflammation, um, throughout your body, especially your gut. And I know Cena can definitely speak to, um, the gut brain issue, um, from a nutritionist perspective. Yes. Thank you so much, um, Gail and Sherry for sharing your insight on, you know, this series of topics. Um, but more, more over, um, my personal experience, well, my secondhand experience with the stroke is actually, uh, witnessing my grandmother have a stroke back in 2015. I was like, actually like seven years ago. And prior to that, I was actually, uh, working on some drug development for Alzheimer's, um, prior to like working at the FDA, but I was actually helping to develop a drug. And, you know, you learn that the, there are a series of drugs that are on the market, but nutrition also can play, um, can also have a really strong impact um, prior, during, and after having a stroke. And I actually got to witness that like firsthand. Um, so specifically my grandmother had a stroke and I was actually like on the phone with her. And I talked to my grandmother at least like three or four times a day. <laughs> like she's like my best friend. And I was talking to her and she just like, she just started slurring her speech and I'm like, what's up? And she just started slurring and I'm just like, something is wrong. And I just like dashed over there like first thing in the morning and she could not speak. She could not walk, talk, sit, do anything. So um, I just like Ubered her to her uh, neurologist and she couldn't speak. So obviously I had to do like the advocating on her behalf to see like what we could do. And I'm talking to her neurologist. Well, first she went to her cardiologist. Then they, you know, they set up the appointment with, with the neurologist, like um, subsequently. And I was like, so like, what are we going to do? And he's just like, oh, I'm going to like up her blood pressure medication. And I'm just like, that's it. And that was like literally around the time I'd started like actually becoming fascinated with like turmeric spice, which is an ancient spice, um, but it actually has the power to create new neurons. Um, like Phoenix was talking about how the rate at which the neurons like actually like die off, um, turmeric specifically helps the brain to um, generate new neurons. So it's extremely important to incorporate that ASAP uh, it also has some blood thinning properties, um, but I've watched it like literally firsthand help my grandmother and actually like something that she does today. And I implement that in like my daily life as well as in my business. But it's very, very important to incorporate that in conjunction with what your doctor is going to prescribe. Now, he did up her blood pressure medication. She also had like existing heart issues. But what I took from that was 
Um, it was, it was her, it was her daily choices that were going to determine if she were going to have a stroke again. Cause he's like, this could happen again. And thankfully it hasn't happened since. And that was back in 2015. So literally every decision, not, not that she's on a seriously strict diet, but she does drink my juices. I like bring to her like weekly. And I'm really just thankful that she was open to it. Um, but just generally speaking, um, and another thing, like you said, with the aspirin, like there are certain types of medications that you can't have. People have existing like clot issues, you know, clot issues, so they can't have the turmeric, you know. So it's it's also important to to clear that and like know that history about yourself, like what Sherry was saying. Um, but you know, also the the timing, you know, like had we would have waited a week. Uh, I'm very thankful that I'm close to her that I was able to get there in time and. Even after like we left the hospital, she had to wait three weeks to see a doctor. And I just started doing like movement with her, like right, left, you know, like touch. she couldn't really do much. She couldn't really stand up or use the bathroom alone. So I had to like help her just do the basic stuff. And even like now she's the only thing now that she has trouble with is like writing Christmas cards. So like sometimes I help her, but like that's like her biggest struggle. But I think the art of her like practicing it you know, she's gaining it back. It's taking a longer time than, you know, all the other activities. Like she still does the laundry, but her actually like, you know, going through the motions and just, just um, doing that practice is helping her. And um, yeah, that was just my, that was just my uh, secondhand experience on that. And I would like to share that, uh, you know, you can get it anywhere. They even have it, you know, you can cook with it. It's just like a, a spice I juice with it um so definitely something to take away that can be helpful if you or any of your loved ones out there are have had a stroke and um once again the timing of it all don't wait you know so don't wait and even if it's basic movement because if you sit right if you sit and you don't move you're like delaying your process of recovery for maybe even years you know some people never recover from having a stroke and that was another thing that I've learned you know so like what if we didn't take that aggressive approach and just coming to her aid and just being there like who knows but we're eternally thankful you know but um definitely check on your loved ones see how they're feeling especially in this heat and I cannot stress she actually had a stroke around it was actually like one of the hottest days of the year it was in July, I remember. And I actually had a boot camp the next week. And I was just like, yeah, I'm going to have to skip this. Um, and I was devastated that she couldn't go. But I remember she was she was in the heat, you know. So prior, just make sure your loved ones are having their, like, now I'm on her about her lemon water. I'm like, did you have your lemon water today? And she's like, all right, I got to get my lemons. Like, lemons, watermelons, cucumbers, all these things are naturally hydrating, you know, especially around this time of the year because, you know, your body's just getting depleted and you know that in turn raises your blood pressure your blood pressure is raised your brain suffers you know less oxygen could potentially lead to a stroke so uh, definitely some other tips and this is a good point right because and this is what i want to stress when um one of the statistics says that one in four people who have had a stroke before have will have it again so your chances of having a stroke once you've had one initially increase. And so all of these different things that we should typically be paying attention to, something as simple as making sure that you're drinking enough water could, to, could potentially invoke another stroke with someone who's already had one before. So that's why it's important to make sure that you are, just as Sherry had mentioned earlier, that you're consistent and on some sort of a regimen, on some sort of a scheduling that you're paying attention to these different things and paying attention to everything, not to where you're trying to go to ER every other day because something is going on. But at the same time, your body alerts you when something is wrong. When people say things like, oh, I've always had, he I've always had headaches or I've always you know, had this pain and I just worked through it. That's, you shouldn't do that something is wrong when, and so, I mean, it may not be immediately wrong, but it could be immediately wrong much later if you just continue to endure whatever it is that you're going through. You don't know how many stories I've read where the first thing and this, the one in the video is another example of that. 
She said she had a headache. I had a headache myself before I had my stroke. And I thought to myself, I don't typically have headaches. I really do pay attention to those things. I don't typically have a headache, but I was like, well, you know, I had a rough week. It's probably just stress. And maybe it was, but it was all of those different things combined together that eventually put me in the hospital. So paying attention to those things, especially post-stroke is very important. So I just was on one of my support groups um, earlier and um, I had someone who had to go back to the hospital. He had a brain bleed and he was having a headache. He was having a headache. And then they decided just to go to the hospital just to be sure as a precaution, he had a brain bleed. It's really important to make sure that you're paying attention to these little things. Um, so I'm glad, Sina, that you brought up the aspect of the caregivers. And I wanted to open this up to everybody because I believe that all of us have had the experience on one side or the other as far as uh, um, working with someone who had a stroke. What advice would you give to people who are caregivers of others that have had strokes? What I see on the support groups is a lot of frustration coming from the stroke survivor and from the caregivers as far as them, you know, it being work on both people's side. And then a lot of times the caregivers not having the empathy, maybe not having the patience, you know, maybe being just tired of having to do all of the different things that it does entail or taking on extra work from this other person who's no longer able to serve in the capacity that they were able to serve in previous to. So what advice do you have for both the caregivers and the stroke survivors to help sort of come to a middle ground when it comes to recovery? I think communication is key for both the best they can, right? To see, um, to make sure you're both on the same page about where you're at, where the patient, the stroke survivor is at, and also for the caregiver to also take some time away from being the caregiver. That that helps at times. You you have to extract yourself away because you still have to take care of you so that you can better take care of that other person, right? And I know a lot of caregivers feel guilty at times because they, they're, they're that person's rock, right? They feel like I have to be there all the time. And um, it, it just goes back to if you are not well, then how are you going to be able to support that person to the, the capacity that they need you to do? So they, you, they each have to know like when their point is there they've reached their point right it, can, it can't get to a point where it's so bad that it's just like i can't stay anymore there's arguments there's you get to that point it's 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 kind of hard so the caregiver has to know when to step back just a little bit and have that another support system to come in and be like can you hold down the floor for this weekend right have a staycation somewhere um I know that's, um, a, it may not be a stroke, but it's similar. Um, Bruce Willis have, a, I think it's Apsia, where he's losing his communication. And so his wife is now, is, is his caregiver. And there was an article in Shape Magazine where she said, like, I had to look look out for my mental state. I I had to stay back just, I'm not the hero, like I need, I also need to take care of myself. And she said that she felt, you know, guilty that, you know, she's his wife, so she should be the one, right? But she understood that she's gonna have to step back just a little bit in order to take care of herself, right? So it's important for the caregiver themselves to also take care of themselves in order to take care of that person. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, coming from having been a caregiver of two of my uh, grandparents, um, you know, there is a difference between um, a caregiver and an advocate. And I learned that with my dad um, some a uh, few years back when he got sick. And um, I, I remember me and my sister uh, taking the responsibility on being his caregiver. And it's not that my other two sisters didn't do it. They just, one lived away and one just wasn't able to do it because she worked 
really crazy hours. And what I learned in that process was, is that a caregiver sometimes can't be that advocate for that person that can't be the advocate for themselves. So again, kind of like what Sherry said, you need a support system. And there are people that don't have families that, you know, that, that can help take care of them. So I think um, having a caregiver and an advocate for that, um, for, for that person helps relieve some of that care, helps relieve the caregiver, because that's kind of what me and my sister did. Like there were weeks that I would be the caregiver and then, you know, and then she would be at the hospital, the advocate for my dad, making sure that things are, you know, happening the way they should be or talking to his doctors, because it can be very overwhelming, especially, you know, when you're, when you're trying to do both and get this person well. So, um, so we would tag team it. So ask for help. And there were times where I didn't want to ask for help. There were times where I would just do it myself. I wouldn't even ask my sister because she was tired and the same, you know, and she would do the same with me. So any advice is ask for help if you need it. Um, and like Sherry said, take that mental time because um, when someone is, when you're taking care of someone, um, and I'm going to go off topic a little bit, but when you're taking care of someone that let's just say it's terminally ill, um, I was told a long time ago is that um, when you normally grieve that person when that diagnosis comes, grieving starts at that moment, that purpose, person could still be alive. And when that person does pass away, if they should, then you're starting that grieving process over again. So I truly believe that even though you're a caregiver and that person may not be terminally ill, you're grieving, you know, and you've got to allow yourself to grieve that maybe that person is not going to be the same person that they were before and willing to accept that. And also, you know, um, accept yourself and what, what your part is in this, you know, and you're not going to be able to do it all. Um, and again, just, just ask for help if you need it. I would just say, um, in addition to that, um, positivity, um, speaking life, like, yes, it's, it's, it's definitely a role, like, it's definitely a role that, um, places a significant impact because if somebody that was doing all these things before cannot do them again, cannot do them in the present moment, that means that now that you literally have to fill in the gap so they can just function regularly. So of course that's going to, um, impact your daily life. Um, so with that acceptance, one thing I noticed that was like the positivity that we were speaking over, like I, it's, it really does boil down to like a will. And I think that with like um, other illnesses as well, like um, my grandmother, she not only recovered from the stroke, but she overcame the cancer. And I remember like one thing um, that she just had this like will, you know, like it was just this, I can, because like I have my grandkids, you know? So like also like the positivity, like it's like speaking life, you know? And their mind, literally, it's a brain. Um, it's brain damaging. So their brain is not up to that. So it it also does help with the um, having that like outside assistance, um, just collectively, and that can also like help them to recover mentally. And like it's like looking back on it now, she doesn't even remember that. But it's like we all helped her, um, you know, come like come out of that with all the assistance. But I think like. Just, just, just having that positive force, like surrounding your loved ones at that time, like they need so much support in addition to the, um, in addition to the physical. So, and that's a really good point. And I want to stress the importance of understanding that that will that Cena is referring to is not something that some people have and some people don't. Mm -hmm. It is this knowledge of knowing that there's something bigger than you that's working and that that having that there having that structure for you there is what gets you through this in the, on the, in the good days and in the bad days so sometimes people talk about you know having willpower or oh, you're just stronger than me and that's not the case you know it, then it's a matter of circling back and understanding what your why is why are you here why are you here why do you think that you're here do you know that you have a reason for being here because we didn't have to make it through these strokes. We didn't have to make it through that. Another good thing that I wanted, well, not a good thing, but something else that I wanted to bring up was the grieving process. 
and Gail that how you brought that up and how it is a process. It is also a process for the survivor because once that person has gone through what it is that they've gone through, they are not the same. And getting your mind around that and still living is key. So sometimes it's like, and I've seen this on support pages, well, why, why am I here? Why was I allowed to live if I have to live this way? And if you don't know or feel that you have a purpose beyond something, beyond what it was that you were doing before, beyond the capabilities that you had before, then that's the, that could almost make you sicker. That could almost provoke another stroke. It's really important to, to grieve on both sides because that person isn't the same and that person won't ever be the same. Person won't ever be the same. We're talking about brain damage, right? Okay, and then so the, and the last thing I want to leave because we're coming up over our time. I do appreciate you guys um, sharing your experiences and sharing your knowledge in this area. And this is something that I definitely could talk on Ex extensively, especially when it comes to the mental aspect of it. When we talk about stress, um, stress promotes inflammation. And the past few years, especially since COVID, we have seen more stroke induced cases than we ever have just within the past two years, which should be an indication of it not just being something that is a physical aspect, but can be brought on by stress, by isolation, by depression, by anxiety, a lot of different things that people have been experiencing during these times of not understanding what is going on, right? So the stress in your, can literally rewire your brain. So this is what I want to leave, especially my survivors with. It can rewire your brain thinking of the bad things, thinking of the self-talk, all of these different things that you do or that you process in your head that's negative can literally rewire your brain. Our brains are different now because of the stroke. What I want to leave my survivors with is if you can have negativity, rewire your brain. Imagine what you can do if you think positively and have it, it should be able to work both ways. If you can rewire your brain thinking negatively, you can rewire your brain thinking positively. So remember that. I know that some people are like, I'm never going to get better. If you say you are never going to get better, you will not. Amen. I thank you guys so much for sharing this platform with me today. As again, a very passionate um, and important um, topic for me. And I appreciate you taking the time. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, our viewers who have viewed. Oh, and I just wanted to make one last quick statement. Next month is Men's Health Month. So we're focusing on our fathers next month. We're really excited to bring a platform of fathers together. So please be on the lookout on our social media sites as we promote uh, different ways that we can acknowledge our dads next month. So we appreciate you all. Thank you so much for coming. Thank and, you. Wow, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.